When I first moved to Chicago, I was young and broke. Craigslist was my two for almost everything. Furniture, job leads, even ride shares. So when I found a cheap apartment just a few miles from downtown, I jumped at the chance. It seemed like a steal. Three bedrooms, cheap rent, and the only catch was that I had to move in quickly, within the week. The ad seemed legit. Urgent. Tenant needed to move in ASAP. Uh, the poster, a man named Jim, explained that he was relocating and needed someone to take over his lease immediately. The photos looked nice enough, and I didn't have time to be picky. I replied to the ad, and within hours, Jim messaged me back. He insisted we meet that night to finalize everything. That should have been my first red flag. But I was excited. Naive. We arranged to meet at the apartment at 10 p.m., which in hindsight was weirdly late for a viewing. But Jim explained that his work hours were crazy and that he could only meet after dark. Again, I brushed it off. I convinced myself that this was just the nature of big city living. When I arrived at the address, the building stood at the end of a narrow, dimly lit street. Its appearance was even shabbier than the photos had suggested. Faded paint, cracked windows, and a flickering hallway light. It was the kind of place you'd expect to find in a ghost story, not in a Craigslist listing. But rent was cheap, and I was desperate. I knocked on the door to apartment 3B, and after a few long, silent moments, Jim opened the door. He was much older than I had expected, maybe mid-fifties, with a hollow look in his eyes and skin that hung loose on his bones. His smile was, was wide, too wide. Come in, he said, stepping aside. I hesitated but forced myself to cross the threshold. The apartment smelled off. A thick, musty scent hung in the air, cow, something like wet wood mixed with rotting fruit. There were boxes scattered everywhere, as if someone had started to pack but stopped halfway. Jim led me through the narrow hallways, talking quickly about how he needed to leave town due to family issues. The more he talked, the more anxious I felt. Can we speed this up? I asked, trying to sound casual. It's late. Jim nodded and handed me the lease papers. But before I could start signing, he paused. One last thing, he said, his voice lowering. The furniture stays. It's included in the lease. That was strange. Who would leave all their furniture behind? I glanced around at the outdated, mismatched pieces and nodded. Sure, that's fine. But Jim wasn't done. One more thing, he said, almost in a whisper. You can't move anything after midnight. What? I laughed nervously, thinking he was joking, but his face was dead serious. After midnight, no furniture, no boxes. Leave everything as it is until morning. Spike. You don't want to disturb anything. You know, that's already settled in. I was creeped out but chalked it up to the weird quirks of a stressed-out guy trying to get rid of his apartment fast. I signed the papers, grabbed the keys, and promised to start moving in the next day. Fast forward to move-in day. Everything went smoothly until the sunset. I had invited a couple of friends to help me move, and by the time we finished unpacking, it was nearing midnight. As I laid the last box down, I remembered Jim's warning, you can't move anything after midnight. I told my friends, half joking about it, they laughed, saying Jim was probably just some superstitious old, old man, but the tension in the room was palpable. At 11.58 p.m., one of my friends, Mark, decided to test the waters. Let's move just one thing, he said, grinning mischievously. Before I could protest, he picked up a small table from the corner of the room and shifted it a few feet to the left. Nothing happened. We all exhaled, laughing nervously. But then, out of nowhere, the lights flickered. The laughter stopped. It's just a bad electrical system, I said quickly, though I wasn't so sure. Another flicker, this time lasting longer. Then a loud thud came from the hallway. My heart raced as we all turned toward the sound. It was as if something heavy had dropped or been dragged across the floor. Mark, trying to stay brave, opened the door and stepped into the hall. It's probably just the neighbors, he muttered. But when he reached the hallway, he froze. What the hell is that? He whispered, stepping back. I moved to see what he was looking at, and that's when I saw it. In the dim light of the flickering bulb, I saw shadows moving, unnatural, inky black shapes crawling along the walls. Uh, they weren't human, they weren't animals, they were something else, and they were moving toward us. Close the door, I shouted. Mark slammed it shut, and we scrambled to lock it, but the thudding continued. It was louder now, and it wasn't just in the hallway, it was in the apartment. Something was moving inside. I turned toward the living room, and my blood went cold. The furniture, the table, the chairs, the couch was all shifting. Slowly, deliberately, 
They were moving back to their original places, as if pulled by invisible hands. And then we heard it, a low, guttural whisper, coming from everywhere at once. Get. Out. Without a second thought, we grabbed our bags and ran for the door. As we sprinted down the stairs, the whispers turned to growls, echoing behind us, chasing us out of the building. We never went back. I called the landlord the next day and told him I was breaking the lease. I didn't care about the money, I just needed to be done with that place. He didn't seem surprised when I told him why. Jim should have told you, he said, sighing. That apartment, it's been vacant for years. You're not the first tenant who's tried to stay there. I hung up, blocked Jim's number, and never used Craigslist again. Story number two. It all started when Sarah, a broke college student, needed a place to live fast. Her roommate had unexpectedly dropped out, and Sarah couldn't afford the rent on her own. Desperate, she turned to Craigslist, scrolling through page after page of listings, until one post caught her eye. The headline was simple. Room for rent, $300 per month, utilities included. The price was too good to be true. The photos of the house showed an old Victorian mansion, a little run-down but charming, nestled deep in the outskirts of town. The owner, named David, said he was offering the room at a reduced rate because it needed some repairs. Sarah thought it was the perfect solution, cheap rent and a quiet place to study. Without hesitation, she emailed David, and by the end of the day, she was packing her things. When Sarah arrived, the house looked even older in person. Uh, the paint was chipped, and the front porch sagged slightly. But the inside was spacious, and her room, though modest, had large bay windows that let in plenty of sunlight. David, a tall man in his mid-fifties, was polite but seemed distant, like he didn't want to make small talk. He handed her the key and gave a brief tour of the house, showing her the common areas and explaining that he worked late at night so she would have the house to herself most evenings. Sarah didn't mind. The solitude would help her focus on her studies. The first few nights were quiet, just as David promised. But on the third night, Sarah woke up to the sound of footsteps. At first, she thought David had come home earlier than usual. But as she lay there listening, she realized the footsteps were too light to be his. They were slow, deliberate, and sounded like they were circling her room. Sarah sat up in bed, her heart racing. The footsteps stopped. She listened for a minute longer before telling herself it was probably the house settling, or maybe David was moving around upstairs. She lay back down and eventually drifted off to sleep. The next morning, she mentioned the noises to David, who brushed it off. Old houses make sounds. You'll get used to it, he said with a strange smile. His tone was dismissive, almost as if he'd heard it all before. As the days passed, the noises grew louder and more frequent. Every night, Sarah heard footsteps just outside her door, but when she opened it, no one was there. Then came the whispers, soft, unintelligible, like someone was murmuring just beyond the walls. The worst part was that they seemed to be getting closer each time. One evening, after a long day of classes, Sarah returned home to find her door slightly ajar. She hadn't left it that way. She pushed it open cautiously, half expecting to find David inside, but the room was empty. Everything appeared to be in place, except for her books. They were stacked neatly on the floor, arranged in a perfect circle. She stared at them in confusion, unsure whether to be scared or angry. She confronted David that night. Are you coming into my room when I'm not here? She demanded, trying to keep her voice steady. David looked at her with wide, innocent eyes. I wouldn't do that. I respect your privacy. His answer didn't sit right with her, but she had no proof, so she let it go. The following night, the noises returned with a vengeance. The footsteps were louder than ever, and this time they were accompanied by something else. A scratching, like fingernails dragging across wood. Sarah's skin crawled as she lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, praying for the sounds to stop. When the scratching became unbearable, she threw off her covers and rushed to the door, determined to confront whatever, or whoever, was out there. But when she opened the door, the hallway was empty. The house was silent. She was about to turn back when she noticed strange on the floor, a trail of muddy footprints, small and bare, leading from the stairs to her room. Trembling, she followed the trail to the top of the staircase. The footprints disappeared as suddenly as they had begun. Convinced that something was terribly wrong with the house, Sarah decided to leave. She packed her bags in a hurry, not caring if she lost her deposit. 
but as she reached for the doorknob, it twisted in her hand, and the door swung open on its own. Standing in the doorway was a little girl, no older than eight, with pale skin and long, tangled hair. She was dripping wet, her eyes wide and unblinking. For a moment, Sarah was frozen in place, staring at the girl, unsure if she was real or a figment of her imagination. Then the girl spoke, her voice a whisper that seemed to echo through the walls. Help me. Before Sarah could react, the girl disappeared, vanishing like a puff of smoke. Sarah stumbled back, her mind racing. She grabbed her phone and dialed 911, but the call wouldn't go through. The screen flickered and died in her hand. In a panic, she ran downstairs to find David, but the house was empty. His bedroom door was wide open, the bed neatly made. It was as if he'd never been there at all. Desperate for answers, Sarah rifled through the papers on his desk. Among the bills and junk mail, she found an old newspaper clipping. The headline read, Local girl drowns in bathtub, caretaker missing. The article was dated over 20 years ago. The girl in the picture looked exactly like the one Sarah had just seen. Suddenly, the house felt colder, darker. Sarah heard the whisper again, this time closer, louder. Help me. She didn't wait to see what would happen next. Grabbing her keys, she bolted for the front door, not stopping until she was safely in her car. She never went back for her things. To this day, she wonders what became of David, if that was even his real name. But one thing is certain, whatever happened in that house, it wasn't just the house settling. Story number three. When James posted a listing on Craigslist for a roommate, he thought it would be a simple way to split rent. The apartment wasn't anything special, an old two-bedroom place with creaky floors and thin walls, but it was cheap. And in a city like this, that mattered. James wasn't picky. All he wanted was someone quiet who could pay rent on time. He received several replies, but one stood out. A woman named Claire said she was moving to the city for work. Her message was polite but brief. Hi, I saw your listing. I'm looking for a place ASAP. Can I come by tonight? Cash up front for the first month. Thanks. James hesitated. It was weird how eager she was, but the offer of cash was tempting. His landlord had been on his case about rent, so he agreed. That evening, Claire showed up at the door with a small duffel bag. She looked normal enough, thin, pale, with long, messy black hair that looked like it hadn't seen a brush in a while. She wore a faded hoodie and ripped jeans, carrying herself like someone trying not to attract attention. She didn't offer much conversation, and James didn't push. He showed her the room, and she handed him a wad of bills. No questions about the apartment, no paperwork, just, this will do. James shrugged it off. Maybe she was just private. Everyone had their quirks, right? But that first night, he began to feel uneasy. The nightmares begin. James was a light sleeper, and it didn't take much to wake him up. Around 2 a.m., he stirred to the sound of someone whispering. Groggy, he sat up in bed and listened. It wasn't clear what was being said, but it sounded like Claire's voice, low and hurried. He figured she was on the phone, maybe having a private conversation. But the strange thing was that there was no break between words, just an endless stream of whispers. The unsettling part? It didn't sound like a one-sided conversation. It was as if she was responding to someone. When the whispering stopped suddenly, James lay frozen in bed, heart pounding. He told himself not to be paranoid. New people always took some getting used to, but the next day was worse. He woke up to find the door to his bedroom slightly ajar. He always locked it before sleeping. His skin prickled as he stood in the doorway, staring at the doorknob. Then, something caught his eye. There were scratches on the outside of the door, small, deliberate scratches, as if someone had been trying to claw their way in. He confronted Claire about it. Did you come into my room last night? She blinked at him, her expression blank. I didn't touch your door, she said flatly. You must have left it open. James wanted to argue, but stopped himself. What was the point? Claire seemed distant, almost disconnected from reality. He told himself it was just a weird coincidence, but deep down, something about her gave him chills. Things get stranger. Over the next few nights, the whispering became a nightly occurrence. No matter how hard James tried to ignore it, the sound wormed its way into his head. It wasn't just coming from Claire's room anymore. It seemed to echo through the walls, filling the entire of her apartment. One night, James decided to confront her. He knocked on her door, uh, but there was no answer. When he tried the doorknob, it was locked. He pressed his ear against the wood, listening. For a moment, 
everything was silent. Then he heard something faint, a soft scratching sound coming from inside her room. That was the last straw. The next day, James told Claire she had to leave. He didn't care about the money. He just wanted her gone. Claire didn't argue. She simply stared at him with those dull, lifeless eyes and said, I'll be gone by tomorrow. Relieved, James went about his day. That night, for the first time in a week, the apartment felt peaceful. He went to bed, convinced that by morning, Claire would be out of his life. But things didn't go that way. The final night. Around 3 a.m., James woke up to the sound of heavy footsteps. Someone was pacing outside his bedroom door. He sat up, his heart pounding. Claire, he called, but there was no response. The pacing stopped, and the doorknob rattled. Slowly, the door began to creak open. Just a crack. James reached for the lamp on his nightstand, but it wouldn't turn on. The room was plunged into complete darkness. He stared at the door, heart thudding in his chest. And then, through the gap, he saw it. An eye, bloodshot and wide, staring at him from the dark hallway. Claire? James whispered, his voice trembling. The door swung open all the way, revealing Claire standing in the doorway. But something was wrong. Her head was tilted at an unnatural angle, her mouth stretched into a wide, eerie grin, and her eyes, they were empty, black as pits. Before James could react, Claire stepped into the room, her movements jerky, like a puppet on strings. She leaned closer to him, that sick grin never wavering. You let me in, she whispered. Her voice was not her own, it was layered, as if many voices were speaking in unison. James scrambled out of bed, uh, backing away toward the corner of the room. But Claire, or whatever she had become, kept coming closer. Her limbs twitched and jerked, as if something inside her was struggling to take control. You shouldn't have let me in, she hissed again. And then she lunged. The aftermath. James woke up the next morning on the floor, drenched in sweat. His heart was racing, and his whole body trembled. For a moment, he thought it had all been a nightmare. But when he looked at the bedroom door, his blood ran cold. The inside of the door was covered in scratches, long, deep gouges that hadn't been there the night before. Panicking, James rushed to Claire's room. He threw the door open, but it was empty. No duffel bag, no sign anyone had ever stayed there. The bed was perfectly made, untouched. Confused and terrified, James called the landlord to ask if Claire had left any forwarding information. But what the landlord said froze him in place. There was no Claire, the landlord said. You've lived alone for the past six months. I've never rented that second room to anyone. James dropped the phone, his mind reeling. He checked the listing on Craigslist, hoping for some clue, but it was gone. No email, no messages, nothing to prove Claire ever existed. And yet, as James stood there in the silent apartment, he could still hear it, faint whispering coming from the walls. Claire, or whatever she was, hadn't left. She was still there waiting and James knew deep down that she always would be. Story number four. I was a college student at the time, living in a cramped apartment with my roommate, Jake. We were broke, as most college kids are, so when I saw a post on Craigslist for a free couch, must pick up today, I immediately jumped on it. The couch in the picture didn't look half bad. It was old, sure, but the kind of retro that could pass for vintage in the right setting. Plus, the price was unbeatable. I reached out to the poster, a woman named Karen, and she responded quickly. The only catch was that we had to pick it up that night. It's gotta go by midnight, she said in her message, sounding a little too desperate. But she insisted it was because the movers were coming in the morning and she was clearing out her late grandmother's house. Jake and I shrugged it off. We figured she just didn't want to miss her window to get everything out. It was already past 9 p.m., but the house wasn't far and we had access to Jake's old pickup truck. The timing wasn't ideal, but that the whole thing seemed straightforward enough. Karen texted us the address, an old house on the outskirts of town. When we arrived, the place looked neglected. The lawn was overgrown, the windows were dark, and the front porch sagged under the weight of years without care. It gave off an eerie vibe, but Jake and I were focused on getting our free couch and getting out of there. We knocked on the door, and after what felt like forever, it creaked open just a crack. Karen stood there, her face pale and drawn, eyes wide. She seemed nervous, almost jittery. You're here for the couch? she asked, her voice soft and shaky. We nodded, and she opened the door wider. It's in the basement, she said, pointing toward a narrow staircase. 
Jake and I exchanged a glance. The basement? We hadn't expected that, but at this point we were too committed to back out. Karen led the way, descending the stairs into the dimly lit basement. As soon as we stepped down, a heavy, musty smell hit us. It was damp, like the air had been sitting stagnant for years. The basement was filled with random old furniture, boxes of dusty trinkets, and a lot of things covered in yellowing sheets. In the corner, illuminated by a single hanging light bulb, sat the couch. It looked like it had been down there for a while, longer than the rest of the furniture. The fabric was stained in places and the cushions were sagging, but it was nothing a good cleaning couldn't fix. Still, something about the room felt off. Go ahead, take it, Karen said, standing behind us. She was watching us closely, too closely. Jake and I lifted the couch, and as we did, something shifted inside. It wasn't the weight of the couch, it was more like something inside the cushions. It felt like we were carrying more than just furniture. I froze. You all right, man? Jake asked, glancing at me. Yeah, yeah, I muttered, shaking it off. We carried the couch up the narrow stairs, struggling to fit it through the old, creaky doorway. Karen didn't help. She just stood there, watching us with that same wide-eyed expression. We loaded the couch into the back of Jake's truck, thanked Karen, and drove off. But as we drove away, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. Karen's behavior was strange, sure, but it was more than that. Something about that basement. It felt heavy. Oppressive. But it was late, and I was tired, so I pushed the thoughts aside. When we got back to our apartment, it was well after midnight. We hauled the couch inside and dropped it in the living room. I'll grab us a couple of beers, Jake said, heading to the kitchen. I sat on the couch for the first time, sinking into the worn cushions. As soon as I did, I felt it again, that strange sensation like something was inside the couch. I leaned over, unzipping one of the cushions, and reached inside. I felt something soft, almost leathery. My heart pounded as I pulled out a small, crumpled object. It was a notebook, old, worn, and covered in dark stains. My hands shook as I opened it. The first few pages were filled with childish drawings, stick figures, houses, trees. But the further I flipped, the more disturbing the images became. The stick figures turned into twisted shapes, shadowy figures looming over beds, people lying on the floor with dark circles around their bodies. Scribbled words appeared between the drawings, help me, get out, and it's here. I felt sick. What the hell is that? Jake asked, returning from the kitchen. I handed him the notebook and his face paled as he flipped through the pages. Then we heard it, a faint thumping sound coming from the couch. We both froze. Did you hear that? I whispered. Jake nodded, eyes wide. We stood there in silence, listening. Uh, the thumping grew louder, more insistent. It was coming from inside the couch. Jake grabbed a knife from the kitchen and, with shaking hands, cut open the back of the couch. As the fabric tore away, a foul stench filled the room. Inside the couch, wedged deep into the springs and stuffing, was something I will never forget. It was a doll, a grotesque, human-shaped doll made of what looked like dried skin. Its face was twisted into a horrifying grin, and its black, hollow eyes stared back at us. Suddenly, the lights flickered and the room seemed to close in around us. The air became thick, suffocating, and a low, guttural growl echoed through the room. The couch began to shake violently, the cushions rising and falling as if something beneath was trying to escape. Get out, I screamed, and we ran. We didn't stop until we were outside, panting and terrified. The next morning, we called a junk removal service. We didn't care about the cost. Uh, the couch, the doll, all of it was taken away. I don't know what happened in that house or what Karen knew, but I do know one thing. Some things, even if they're free, come at a price. Story number five. Craigslist couch. Mike was a bargain hunter, always prowling Craigslist for cheap furniture and knickknacks. He prided himself on finding hidden gems, antiques, rare collectibles, anything with history. So when he saw an ad for a vintage leather couch being sold for, for only $50, it seemed like a steal. The seller's message was vague, but what intrigued him most was that the ad said, simply said, Come get it today. Need it gone. Urgent. The couch looked worn, but still had a rich, deep brown color that Mike loved. It was the kind of furniture that added character to a room. Without thinking much, he messaged the seller, who responded almost immediately. The address was on the far outskirts of town, down a series of twisting roads that eventually led Mike to an old, crumbling house. The place had clearly seen better days. 
The yard was overgrown, and the paint peeled from the walls like dead skin. Mike hesitated, but figured $50 was worth a little creepiness. The seller, a frail woman in her 70s, greeted him at the door. Her sunken eyes darted nervously around as if she was waiting for something to jump out from behind him. She didn't smile. You came for the couch, she said, more as a statement than a question. She quickly led him inside without waiting for a response. The house smelled faintly of mildew, with dust hanging in the air like a fine mist. The couch sat in the middle of the dim living room, much larger in person than it appeared in the photos. The leather seemed darker, almost black, and the fabric creaked ominously as Mike ran his hand along it. Why are you selling it so cheap? Mike asked, half-joking to hide his growing discomfort. The woman didn't meet his gaze. It needs to go, she said quietly. Today. He considered asking more questions, but the way her eyes darted nervously shut him down. He just wanted to get the couch and leave. After a quick negotiation, though the woman barely seemed interested in the money, Mike managed to lug the massive couch into his pickup truck. It took a lot of effort, but he eventually got it strapped down and drove off, eager to get it home. Once back at his apartment, he arranged the couch in the center of his living room. It fit perfectly, and for a moment, he felt a wave of satisfaction. It looked even better here than it had in that musty old house. But as the evening wore on, an unsettling feeling crept over him. Something about the couch felt off. At first, it was small things. The apartment felt colder than usual. The lights seemed dimmer, even though he'd just replaced the bulbs. He brushed it off as fatigue from moving the heavy couch, but that night he had the worst sleep of his life. He dreamt of dark figures standing over him, their faces hidden in shadow, whispering in a language he couldn't understand. Every time he tried to scream, no sound came out. When he woke up, drenched in sweat, the first thing he noticed was the couch. The cushions appeared slightly indented, as if someone had been sitting there while he slept. He tried to shake it off, convincing himself it was his imagination. Over the next few days, the strange occurrences escalated. At night, he began hearing soft, creaking sounds, like leather stretching under weight, even when he was the only one in the apartment. Once, he swore he saw a shadowy figure sitting on the couch out of the corner of his eye, but when he turned, it was gone. Then came the smell. It started subtly, a faint, rotting odor that seemed to cling to the air around the couch. No matter how much Mike cleaned or sprayed air freshener, the smell wouldn't go away. In fact, it seemed to get worse, until his entire apartment smelled like decaying flesh. Frustrated and freaked out, Mike called his friend Alex to help him move the couch out of his apartment. Alex, always skeptical of Mike's Craigslist finds, showed up with a smirk. Dude, it's just an old couch. You're probably overthinking it. But when Alex stepped inside and took a whiff of the air, his smirk faded. What the hell, man? That stinks like something died in here. Together, they tried to move the couch, but it wouldn't budge. No matter how hard they pushed or pulled, it was as if the couch had fused with the floor. Mike's frustration turned to fear when Alex suddenly recoiled, his face pale. Dude, Alex whispered, his voice trembling. Look. Mike followed his gaze to the back of the couch. A seam in the leather had torn slightly, revealing something underneath. A dark red-brown stain soaked into the padding. It looked disturbingly like dried blood. Panic set in as Mike frantically tried to rip the couch apart. They tore at the cushions, and as they did, a horrible realization set in. Stuffed inside the couch were old, brittle bones, human bones. And worse, the deeper they dug, the more they found. Pieces of skull, ribs, fragments of teeth. The couch had been filled with them. Mike stumbled back in horror, his mind reeling. He dialed 911, his hands shaking. When the police arrived, they cordoned off the area and took the couch away. The officers were tight-lipped, but Mike could see the disgust in their eyes. A few days later, Mike was called into the station for questioning. The detective sat across from him with a grim look. The remains inside that couch belong to multiple victims, the detective said. We're still identifying them, but we found at least five different sets of remains. Whoever sold you that couch, Mike's stomach turned. He thought of the old woman, her twitchy, nervous eyes. What happened to her? He asked. The detective paused. We went to the house where you said you bought the couch. It's been abandoned for years. The woman you described doesn't live there and hasn't for over a decade. Neighbors said she vanished after her husband was arrested for a string of brutal murders. They never found all the bodies. 
Mike never slept in his apartment again. Story number six. Tyler was broke. His freelance gigs dried up, and with bills piling up, he needed cash. Fast. One night, while scrolling through Craigslist, he stumbled upon a post that seemed like an answer to his prayers. Free couch. Good condition. Must pick up tonight. First come, first served. It sounded too good to be true, but Tyler wasn't going to question it. He needed furniture for his bare apartment, and a decent couch would save him from sitting on the floor all the time. The listing had a phone number. Tyler texted right away and got an immediate reply. Come by before midnight. No later. The message included an address on the far side of town. The urgency was odd, but Tyler figured someone else might claim the couch if he didn't act quickly. By 10.30 p.m., Tyler borrowed a friend's truck and drove across the city. The neighborhood was rough, boarded up windows, flickering streetlights, and crumbling houses. He pulled up to a small, dark house with peeling paint. The only sign of life was a dim porch light flickering above the front door. Tyler texted the number from the listing. Moments later, a reply buzzed in. It's on the porch. Just take it. The simplicity of the message made Tyler uneasy, but he brushed it off. The truck's headlights illuminated the porch, where a couch sat under the weak light. It was worn, but not terrible. A dark green, floral pattern with frayed edges. Definitely used, but better than nothing. Tyler decided to load it up and leave as quickly as possible. As he dragged the couch toward the truck, a strange smell hit him. A mix of damp fabric and something metallic, almost like rust. He paused, wondering if it had been left out in the rain. But the night was dry, and there were no stains or wet spots. He ignored the unease creeping into his gut, hoisted the couch onto the truck bed, and drove off. The first night, Tyler got home around midnight and hauled the couch into his apartment. Too exhausted to do much else, he plopped down on it. It creaked beneath his weight, and as he leaned back, he swore he heard a soft sigh like the couch had exhaled. He froze, holding his breath. But after a moment of silence, he laughed at himself. It was just the old spring settling. He decided to call it a night, dragging himself to bed. That's when things got strange. At around 3 a.m., Tyler woke up suddenly. The apartment felt wrong. The air was thick, oppressive, and a strange scent lingered, faint but unmistakable. That same metallic smell like old blood. And then he heard it. A faint sound coming from the living room. The soft shuffling of fabric. Tyler sat up, his pulse racing. It sounded as if something or someone was moving on the couch. He grabbed his phone, turning on the flashlight, and crept toward the living room. When the beam of light hit the couch, he froze. The cushions were slightly indented as if someone had been sitting there, yet the room was empty. He stared at the couch for a long moment, trying to convince himself it was just as his imagination. He shook off the fear and returned to bed, but sleep didn't come easily. A presence over the next few days, the apartment felt different. Tyler couldn't explain it, but the air seemed colder, heavier, like someone was always watching him, and the smell, that faint metallic tang, never went away. Then, the noises started. At first, it was subtle, just soft creaks and groans from the couch, like the springs shifting. But soon, it escalated. Tyler would hear what sounded like muffled footsteps circling the living room, only to find the room empty. One night, he came home from running errands to find the couch cushions rearranged. He knew for a fact he hadn't left them that way. His heart raced, but he told himself there had to be a logical explanation. Maybe he was tired, maybe he was forgetting things. But the worst part? Every time he sat on the couch, he felt it. The overwhelming sense that he wasn't alone. The voice. A few nights later, Tyler was dozing off on the couch when he heard something that chilled him to his core. A voice. Soft, breathy, and right next to his ear. This is mine. Tyler bolted upright, heart hammering in his chest. He turned on every light in the apartment, but there was no one there. Shaking, he checked the couch thoroughly, lifting cushions, feeling along the fabric, but found nothing unusual. Yet the voice lingered in his mind, haunting him. Whose voice was that? The next day, Tyler decided he needed to get rid of the couch. He listed it back on Craigslist. Free couch. Good condition. Must pick up tonight. First come, first served. He felt a little guilty, but he was desperate to get the thing out of his life. Within an hour, someone responded to the ad. A man named Eddie agreed to pick it up that night. Tyler waited anxiously. When Eddie arrived, Tyler helped him load the couch into his van. He wanted to warn Eddie that something was wrong with it, but the words wouldn't come. All he could say was, 
Good luck, man. Eddie just chuckled and drove off. The call that night, Tyler slept more soundly than he had in days. For the first time, the apartment felt lighter, as if a weight had been lifted. But just as he was starting to relax, his phone buzzed. It was a text from Eddie. Hey man, weird question. Did anything strange happen with this couch? Tyler's stomach twisted. Before he could reply, another message came through. Never mind, I'll figure it out. Um, Tyler's fingers hovered over the screen, unsure of what to say. But before he could respond, his phone buzzed again. This time, it was a picture message. He opened it, and his blood ran cold. It was a photo of the couch taken inside Eddie's apartment. There, sitting on the couch, was a shadowy figure, a gaunt, faceless shape hunched over as if waiting for something. The message that followed made Tyler's heart stop. I think it wants to come back. And then, Tyler noticed something terrifying. Behind the shadowy figure on the floor was something familiar, his own reflection staring back at him. Story number seven. It all started with an ad. I was browsing Craigslist one night, mindlessly scrolling through the gig section when something caught my eye. It was an offer for free professional headshots. One hour photo shoot, no strings attached. The post went on to explain that a photographer named Ray was building his portfolio and needed models of all types. The photo shoot was free and all I had to do was show up. I'd always wanted some decent photos of myself and being a broke college student, this seemed like the perfect opportunity. I figured the worst case scenario was that the photos might be bad, but since it was free, I had nothing to lose. I sent an email expressing my interest and Ray replied almost immediately. He sounded professional, his tone polite and enthusiastic. He said he was based out of a studio on the outskirts of the city and we set up a time for the following Saturday evening. When Saturday came, I felt a little nervous, but I chalked it up to excitement. I arrived at the address he'd given me, and my initial reaction was confusion. The studio wasn't in a normal part of town for businesses. It was in a more industrial area, surrounded by old warehouses and abandoned lots. But the building itself looked fine, just a bit run down. I figured maybe Ray had found a cheap spot to rent. I knocked on the heavy metal door, and after a few moments, it creaked open. Ray stood in the doorway, smiling. He was older than I'd imagined, probably in his mid-forties, with messy gray hair and round glasses. He wore a loose-fitting shirt and jeans, looking more like an eccentric artist than a professional photographer. Still, he seemed friendly enough. Come on in, he said, stepping aside. The inside of the studio was a stark contrast to the outside. The space was large, with high ceilings, white walls, and a massive backdrop set up against one side. Photography equipment was scattered around, lights, tripods, and reflectors. It looked legit, and my nerves settled a bit. Ray offered me water, and we chatted for a bit before the shoot. He told me he'd been in photography for years, but had taken a break and was now trying to rebuild his portfolio. It all seemed harmless enough, so when he asked if I was ready, I nodded and stood in front of the backdrop. At first, everything was fine. Ray gave me directions, turn this way, smile, look serious, standard stuff. But after about 20 minutes, things started to feel weird. He began asking me to pose in stranger ways. Can you sit on the floor? Maybe lay down? His tone was calm, almost too calm. I hesitated but complied, not wanting to be rude. But the more he directed me, the more uncomfortable I felt. His requests became odder, Close your eyes, relax your body, pretend you're asleep. Something about the way he said it sent a chill down my spine. Why do you need me to pretend I'm asleep? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. It's just for the mood, he said, smiling. But there was something off about his smile, something that made my stomach twist. I sat up, feeling uneasy. I think that's enough for tonight, I said, trying to sound casual. Ray's smile faltered for a second, but then it returned wider than before. Just a few more shots. You've been doing great. I stood up and stepped away from the backdrop, shaking my head. No, I'm good. I think I'm ready to go. The room felt colder suddenly. Ray didn't say anything, but his eyes never left me as I gathered my things. The silence between us was thick, suffocating. I could feel his gaze following me as I moved toward the door. Are you sure you don't want to see the pictures first? He asked, his voice low now, almost a whisper. I didn't answer. My instincts were screaming at me to leave, and I wasn't about to stick around any longer. I reached for the door handle, but it wouldn't budge. My heart jumped into my throat. 
It locks from the inside, Ray said, still standing behind me. He was closer now, much closer than before. I hadn't heard him move, but there he was, looming just a few feet away. I fumbled with the lock, trying to stay calm, but my hands were shaking. Finally, the door clicked open and I stumbled out into the night. I didn't look back. I didn't want to see if Ray was still watching me. As I hurried to my car, I could feel my pulse pounding in my ears. Something wasn't right about that place. About him. I drove home in a daze, replaying the evening in my head, trying to convince myself I was overreacting. But when I got home and opened my email, I saw a message from Ray. My heart sank. It had been sent just minutes after I left. Um, I got some great shots of you tonight. I'll send them over soon, it read. But the email had an attachment. An image. I opened it, and my blood ran cold. It was a photo of me, lying on the floor of his studio, eyes closed. But it wasn't from tonight. The image looked older. The colors were slightly faded, and the clothes I was wearing weren't the same ones I had worn tonight. I stared at the picture, trying to make sense of it. I had never posed like that. I had never worn those clothes. And then I saw the date in the corner of the image. 2015. Four years before I had ever contacted Ray. My phone buzzed. Another email. This time the subject line read, More to come. I didn't sleep that night, and I never heard from Ray again. I deleted the emails, blocked his number, and never looked at Craigslist again. To this day, I wonder how he had those photos of me, and I fear what else he might have in that dark, locked studio. Story number eight. Jamie had just moved into a new apartment, excited to start fresh after a messy breakup. The small studio had seen better days, but the rent was affordable, and it was conveniently located near her job. On her second day there, while unpacking a few boxes, she decided to check out the basement, which she had been told was just for storage. As she stepped down the creaky stairs, Jamie felt an odd chill in the air. The basement was dimly lit and filled with rows of dusty furniture, old boxes, and other random items left behind by previous tenants. She moved slowly, peeking into each box and feeling a mix of curiosity and unease. In the far corner, she spotted something strange. A small, vintage tape recorder sitting on an old wooden crate. It was covered in dust, but the red light on the front indicated it was still functional. Next to it lay a stack of unlabeled cassette tapes. Intrigued, Jamie decided to take the recorder and a few tapes back to her apartment. After dinner, she set the tape recorder on her coffee table and inserted one of the cassettes. She pressed play, eager to hear what was on it. At first, all she heard was static. Then a voice crackled through the speaker, deep and distorted, almost like a whisper. Help me. She's coming for me. Jamie's heart raced. She sat up straighter, straining to listen. The voice continued, growing more frantic. She won't stop until I'm gone. Please. You have to help me. Jamie felt a chill run down her spine. She glanced at the clock. It was already past midnight. Unsure whether to be frightened or intrigued, she pressed stop and set the tape aside, her mind racing with questions. The next night, she decided to listen to another tape, hoping for some clarity. As the tape played, she heard the same voice, but this time it sounded weaker, more desperate. I can see her now. She's watching me. If you find this, you need to get out of here. Don't trust anyone. Unease settled in her stomach as the voice trailed off into static. Jamie's thoughts began to swirl. Who was this person? What were they talking about? She couldn't shake the feeling that the tapes were a warning, but warning about what? The following day, curiosity got the better of her. She spent hours digging through the old boxes in the basement, looking for more tapes or clues. Most were filled with junk, but then she found a small notebook hidden beneath some old clothes. Flipping through its pages, Jamie discovered that it belonged to a previous tenant named Mark. The entries uh, started innocently enough, day-to-day -day musings about, about life and work. But as she continued reading, the tone shifted. I can feel her presence in the apartment, one entry read. It's like she's in the walls, watching. I've started seeing things out of the corner of my eye. I can't sleep anymore. Each entry grew darker, revealing paranoia and fear. The tapes are the only thing keeping me sane. If someone finds this notebook, I hope they believe me. She's real. She's here. Jamie felt a knot tighten in her stomach. She couldn't help but connect the dots between the tapes and the notebook. Whoever had lived in her apartment before her had been terrified. But terrified of what? That night, she listened to another tape, her heart pounding as the familiar voice began again. 
I'm not alone in here. She's getting closer. I can hear her whispering. She's waiting for me to fall asleep. You have to understand, this isn't just paranoia. Suddenly, the recording cut off abruptly, replaced by a low, eerie humming sound. Jamie's breath caught in her throat. She pressed rewind, hoping to hear the end, but the tape continued to play the humming. Panic rose within her, and she turned off the recorder. As she lay in bed that night, she couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. Every shadow seemed to shift, and every creak of the building made her jump. After tossing and turning, she finally drifted off to sleep. She awoke suddenly, heart racing, to the sound of whispering. It was faint at first, but gradually grew louder. Help me, it called, soft yet chilling, echoing through the apartment. Jamie's eyes shot open. The room was dark, the only light coming from the street lamp outside. She froze, fear gripping her as she listened intently. Uh, the, the voice sounded familiar. Was it the voice from the tapes? She fumbled for her phone, illuminating the room with its weak glow. Hello, she called out, her voice shaking. The whispering stopped and a cold draft swept through the apartment, causing the hairs on the back of her neck to stand up. Jamie's heart raced as she jumped out of bed, the instinct to flee overwhelming her. She stumbled toward the door when she noticed the tape recorder had turned itself back on, the red light flickering ominously. The tape played and the voice returned, now sounding closer. You shouldn't have listened. She's here. She's coming for you. Jamie's blood ran cold. Just as she turned to run, she saw a dark figure standing in the corner of the room. It was a woman with hollow eyes, her mouth twisted into a sinister smile. The shadows seemed to swirl around her, consuming the light in the room. Jamie's instinct kicked in, and she bolted for the door. As she grabbed the knob, she heard the woman whisper, You can't escape me. With a surge of adrenaline, Jamie threw open the door and raced down the hallway, ignoring the calls of her neighbors. She didn't stop until she reached the street. Gasping for breath, her heart pounded in her chest as she glanced back at the building. The dark figure stood at her window, watching her with a malevolent grin. The next morning, Jamie returned with a friend and collected her belongings. She never looked back. The tapes remained in the apartment, their chilling warnings echoing in her mind as she left. Years later, she heard the apartment was still being rented out, the previous tenants always moving out under mysterious circumstances. The tape recorder still sat in the basement, waiting for someone new to find it, to listen, and to awaken the spirit that had never left. Story number nine. When Marissa first saw the ad on Craigslist, she was skeptical. The title read, Rare Vintage Watch, $50. It had a picture of a beautifully ornate pocket watch, the kind that looked like it belonged in a museum rather than in a modern world. She had always loved antiques, and the price was too good to pass up. The seller, a man named Victor, lived about an hour away in a quiet suburb. He texted her promptly after she expressed interest, saying he could meet that evening. Come to my place. You can check it out before buying, the message read. Marissa felt a shiver of excitement mixed with unease but shrugged it off. It was just a watch, and she was in desperate need of a distraction. The meeting that evening, she drove to Victor's house, which was located on a street lined with trees that almost blocked the sunset. The house itself was old, with ivy creeping up the sides and a porch that creaked ominously underfoot. Marissa felt a strange pull to the place, as if it were drawing her in. Victor answered the door, a tall man with a crooked smile and sharp eyes. You made it, he said, stepping aside to let her in. The interior was dimly lit, filled with shelves of odd trinkets and dark wooden furniture. Sorry about the mess. I'm a bit of a collector, he said, leading her into a small room cluttered with various antiques. The watch was there, sitting on a velvet cloth, gleaming in the low light. Marissa felt her breath hitch. The watch was even more stunning up close. Intricate engravings swirled across its surface, and the hands were frozen at a peculiar time, 2.13. This beauty belonged to my grandfather, Victor explained. He claimed it had a mind of its own, said it could tell you things if you were open to them. Marissa raised an eyebrow. What do you mean? Victor waved his hand dismissively. Just an old man's tales. Want to try it on? Without thinking, Marissa reached out, took the watch, and fastened it around her wrist. The first signs... As soon as it clicked into place, a chill ran down her spine. It felt like a weight had settled onto her wrist, and the room seemed to dim further, shadows stretching and bending oddly. You okay? Victor asked, a flicker of concern in his eyes. Yeah, I'm fine, she replied, but she felt anything but fine. 
Just keep it on while we talk, he said almost too eagerly. They chatted for a while, but as time passed, Marissa felt increasingly uncomfortable. A creeping sensation began to envelop her, making her feel trapped in the small room. She glanced at the watch, and to her surprise, the hands began to move, slowly ticking away from 2.13. She blinked in disbelief as the time shifted to 2.14, then 2.15. What the hell, she muttered under her breath. Victor noticed and grinned. It's a special piece, isn't it? Marissa wanted to rip the watch off her wrist, but something stopped her, a compulsion she couldn't quite understand. The Dark Revelation The next few days were a blur. Marissa returned home, but the watch stayed on her wrist, refusing to be taken off. Each tick felt like a pulse, a heartbeat that synced with her own. As the days went by, strange occurrences began to unfold. She started having vivid dreams. Nightmares, really. They were always set in the same shadowy room, and a figure loomed in the corner, watching her. In the dreams, the figure never spoke, but she could feel its intense gaze. Each morning, she woke up with the watch still fastened to her wrist, a cold sweat soaking her sheets. One day, while at work, she noticed her co-worker Mark looking unwell. He had dark circles under his eyes, and his face was pale. When she approached him to ask what was wrong, he muttered, I just can't sleep. It feels like someone's watching me. Her stomach twisted. The same words she had thought in her dreams. The Price of Curiosity Desperate to understand what was happening, Marissa returned to Victor's house. When she arrived, the atmosphere felt thicker, suffocating. She knocked on the door and Victor opened it, his smile fading as he saw the watch on her wrist. Ah, you're back, he said, though his voice trembled slightly. What do you think of the watch? It's different. I don't think it's normal, Victor's expression shifted. What do you mean? Marissa took a deep breath. It's causing nightmares. I think it's connected to something dark. He paused, his eyes narrowing. You need to understand, some things are better left alone. The watch can show you truths, but not all truths are good. What do you mean? Victor stepped closer, lowering his voice. There's a price for knowledge. The more you wear it, the more it claims you. Panic surged through her. Claims me? What does that mean? You'll begin to see things, things you shouldn't. And if you take it off, it may not let you. The breaking point. Marissa felt a rush of fear and adrenaline. She turned to leave, but Victor grabbed her wrist, his grip surprisingly strong. You can't just walk away. It doesn't work that way. With a surge of strength, she pulled free and sprinted to her car. Heart pounding, she drove home, desperate to remove the watch. That night, as she tried to take it off, the watch felt glued to her skin. She struggled, panic rising as she felt it tighten around her wrist. With a sudden, violent tug, she ripped it off, but not without a price. A sharp pain shot through her, and she felt a cold presence envelop her. Marissa collapsed on the floor, gasping as the shadows in her room thickened, pride swirling around her. The figure from her dream stood before her, now solid, its face a void of darkness. You wanted to be free. It hissed, echoing Victor's words. But you belong to me now. The final confrontation... With the last of her strength, Marissa scrambled to her feet and reached for the pocket watch. She had to get rid of it. As she touched it, a surge of energy pulsed through her. The shadows clawed at her, trying to pull her back, but she fought against them and focusing all her will on the watch. With a deafening crack, the watch shattered in her hands. A blinding light erupted and the shadows recoiled, screeching as they were pulled back into the void. As the light faded, Marissa found herself alone in her apartment, the remnants of the watch scattered on the floor. She fell to her knees, panting, shaken but free. The aftermath, Marissa never returned to Victor's house. The memories of that night haunted her, but as time passed, the nightmares faded and the shadows receded. She knew she was lucky to escape with her life, but every now and then she would catch a glimpse of a dark figure in her peripheral vision, lingering just out of sight, and sometimes late at night, when the world was quiet, she could still hear the faint ticking of a watch.